Hi there, welcome to the Zelda Knits podcast. I'm Zelda. I'm a knitwear designer from Edinburgh, Scotland. And if you've watched any of the previous episodes of this podcast, this one might be a little bit different. I wanted to focus entirely on my knitworthy collections and the patterns contained within because I'm super excited that our latest knitworthy collection, Knitworthy 7, is now available to pre-order on my website, zelda.com. So I'm going to explain a bit about what on earth Knitworthy is, what the Knitworthy collection is, how it works, how you can order that, and talking about the new collection got me really excited about looking back at our older patterns, and I've put together my 10 favourite Knitworthy patterns. It was very hard to choose. They are in no particular order, but I'm going to go through all of those. So I've got those lined up here and tell you a little bit about each pattern and the yarn I used, which Knitworthy collection you can find them in. Um, and some of them have like fun, creative, kind of weird constructions. So I figured this video is a really good way to explain how those work. And hopefully you'll feel inspired to cast on something new. I want to cast on everything right now. There is something about this like back to school, autumn is coming but not quite here, time of year that just, it just makes me want to cast on everything. I'm trying very hard not to do that because I already have plenty of works in progress but talking about what you could cast on is a fun way to like scratch that itch and it has been actually kind of warm for knitting here the last few days. This morning, um, it's warmed up now I think, but this morning there was like this really nice crisp chill in the air and I love that. I love, I love summer, I love the warm weather, but I love that kind of when you get those first crisp days and the leaves are starting to turn. And much as I'm excited about like cozying up with a project and dark nights and hot chocolate and all of those good things. I'm also trying to soak up the last of summer. My family and I went camping last weekend um, in Perthshire, just like an hour and a half north of here, and it was so nice. It was warm enough to eat outside comfortably, and it was really beautiful. We um, walked by some waterfalls and just kind of hung out on the rocks. There's a bakery in um, the village of Dunkeld called Aaron that we love. So we went there nice and early and got some um, sausage rolls and some pastries. Really nice to still feel like it was still summer and we could still like soak up being out in nature. Um, so yeah, I've been super busy. I've also been trying to get everything ready for the launch of Knitworthy 7. Um, so yeah, I just haven't had a chance to sit down and record this, but I really wanted to make another episode. I've been really enjoying these. I will have some more about things like sweater construction and fit. I know a lot of you have been enjoying those, um, but for today I wanted to focus on Knitworthy. If you've been following me for a long time, you probably know what the Knitworthy collection is, but for those of you who are new to my patterns, new to following, or maybe just watching this for the first time, you've never heard of me, I wanted to go through what Knitworthy is. So Knitworthy obviously is a phrase in used by knitters, I didn't coin it, um, it's a nice succinct way of saying that someone is worth your time to knit them a gift. And that doesn't mean that someone isn't inherently worthy, like I don't want to get into classifying whether some humans have more worth than others, that's obviously really gross, but not everyone in your life is really worthy of your time and attention, and not everyone in your life who is incredibly worthy of your time and attention appreciates a knitted gift. Knitwear is not for everyone. There's no point in knitting something for someone who's not going to love it, not going to wear it. Not everyone wears knitwear, and for some people receiving something like a shawl that is in a delicate yarn that they might have to hand wash, they might have to figure out blocking, that would feel more like being given a chore than a gift. So it's about considering whether the people that you're knitting for will love what you knit or whether there is something that might be more appropriate as a gift for them so that you can save your precious knitting time for people who are really going to appreciate it and really going to love it. There's obviously lots of 
horrible sort of patriarchy tied up in the idea of the sweater curse. But I feel like part of it is that as knitters we often get caught up in the idea of what someone will love and that we're pouring so much of us into our work without necessarily taking the time to stop and think about whether the other person will understand that work and see how much effort you put in and whether they actually want the thing you're making. Is it the colours they like? Do they wear sweaters? Do they wear knitted sweaters? Do they wear wool? Are they allergic to wool? Whatever it is. And it's really heartbreaking to put that much effort into something for someone else and have them not appreciate it or maybe they like it but they don't get how much it means to you to give that amount of time and attention to someone. It's partly why all of the Knitworthy projects except one or two are pretty small. They're all accessories. Um, of course, you can have a pretty big accessory like a shawl or a blanket. Most of them are one skein or two skein projects. Um, each collection has a mixture of projects in terms of difficulty, in terms of amount of time involved. So the collections themselves are, this year is number seven. Almost annually, I skipped a couple of years in the middle I've released a collection of accessory projects that would make good gifts, kind of in the run up to the holidays, we don't focus on any particular holiday, um, but they start kind of at the beginning of knitting season, which I feel like is now when we're starting to think maybe more about what we want to make for the winter, spending maybe more time sitting down inside. Not everyone is a seasonal knitter, but I did all year round, but I still get excited about knitting season. So there are collections of patterns for gifts. Um, each one was originally released around late August, September, and then a new pattern would be released every two weeks. And those patterns are always a surprise, which is why I'm talking about older noteworthy patterns and not the upcoming collection, because that is strictly under wraps for now. So each pattern is a surprise in your inbox. You can order the whole collection in advance and then you'll automatically receive each pattern as it's released. It's not a subscription in terms of payment, it's just like you buy the collection in advance and then you get each pattern with no further payment due. If you are not a mystery knits person, you're not a surprises person, but you find that you really like one of the patterns, you don't want to pre-order, you don't want to take that risk, but you find that you really like one or two of the patterns. They are always available individually when that sort of surprise release period is over, so in mid-December once the final pattern in the collection has come out, so once the final pattern in the new collection is out, we will release all of the patterns from Knitworthy 7 as individual patterns. And that means that all of the patterns I'm talking about today are available in two ways. They're available in the Knitworthy collections that they were originally published in, which you can still buy as a whole collection. And if you like, I think it works out if you like more than three patterns, it's a better deal to buy the whole collection. And they're also available as individual single patterns, just like any other pattern that I've published. The new collection is currently available at an early bird price, so I wanted to let you know that. It will be available at the early bird price until the first pattern comes out, and the first pattern will be out on September 21st. We've had a lot of questions about whether the collection will be available on Ravelry. It is currently only available on my website, and that's just because it's kind of a limitation of how the Ravelry database works. P patterns are sort of the primary thing in the database, and then patterns can be connected to a source, like a pattern collection or a book. And you can't create that collection, that source, until there is a pattern to connect to it. So until we release the first pattern, we can't offer the whole collection for sale on Ravelry. When we release the first pattern, we will put it up on Ravelry. If you want to get that nice early bird discount and pre-order pre -order on our website, you can do so and then when the first pattern is released we will include instructions in like the update you get with the pattern telling you how to connect it to your Ravelry um, so that you can store it in your Ravelry library and you'll then get the updates available in Ravelry as well.
the last couple of years we've also run a knitworthy social club on our network with some posts from us kind of offering prompts and things to think about while you're knitting gifts and a, a knit along element and so you can get together with other people and talk about the projects in the new collection or really any other gift knitting that you're doing and we're not really into very strict rules and um, this year we're going to run that slightly more casually and have that as a group in the network that is open for anyone to join it's not a separate fee um, it's free to join and it will be slightly more casual than in previous years but I think it's going to be a really lovely community place to talk about planning your knitted gifts if you are knitting gifts talking about the projects in the new collection or previous collections um, it's a great place to go if you are knitting something and have questions we've built up a really welcoming um, encouraging community in the network the network is a community that, that I run on the Mighty Networks platform. It's free to join, it's pretty easy to use, um, and we'd love to see you there. The first pattern from a Knitworthy collection that I wanted to highlight is the Eskimer Cowl. It is this cabled cowl. This is the longer version. The pattern comes in two lengths. So you can make this long cowl that you can wear sort of a, it's more like an infinity scarf, I suppose. So you can wear it double wrapped, or you can knit it shorter and um, have a single loop. It's in this gorgeous reversible cable pattern, which reversible cables are worked on basically a ribbed base. And by doing that, this is like a one by one rib. You can probably see that if I pull it apart a bit. And by doing that, it means that you get the same pattern on both sides, which is ideal for a cowl, especially one like this, where it's got a twist in it, which I think helps it lie perfectly in folds. It's really easy to wear. You just kind of drape it on and it always looks good. And it's worked from it's not really side to side because it's a continuous loop, but it's worked this way rather than in the round. You begin with a provisional cast on and you knit a stockinette tube. You sort of fold it so the two halves of the tube are together. And then you work across that tube, taking one stitch from the front and knitting it, and then taking one stitch from the back and purling it. The end you do the opposite and work another tubular section. And that has a couple of advantages. You can create this twist that's really locked into that section, and then there is another twist here and it means that you're grafting or kitchener stitching the ends together without having to join two ribbed sections which is a lot more complicated and will be like offset by half a stitch so this way you get an easier option and it also looks much cleaner and if you're new to kitchener stitch we do have a tutorial for that so I'll put a link to that as well as the pattern and um, in the show notes for you and we knit this one in Dererum Natura Ulysse, which is a really lovely, um, really woolly wool, but also very soft. It's merino. It's a non-superwash merino, which if you've only ever used superwash merino, it's a very different handle. It's got a completely different texture without that superwash treatment. And it's one of my favorite yarns. And this cowl, which is the Eskimer cowl, I'm... Not 100% sure if I'm butchering the pronunciation there, but it's E S T I M A R, and it's available in the Knitworthy Four collection as well as as a single pattern. The second pattern I wanted to show you from Knitworthy is probably the most popular pattern from any of the Knitworthy collections, I think, and this is the Millet Mitts Middens. And these are such a fun project to work. It's three colors. You can play around with the colors. I really like it in this sort of high contrast combination. You have this lice pattern that kind of looks like little snowflakes. The cuffs have a sort of very classic Norwegian um, snowflake pattern. And I really like the construction of these cuffs. So if I fold it back, you can probably see how it's constructed. So you cast on here, work a little bit of ribbing, 
work your color work and then I don't oh, apparently I never woven that end so you work this with the color work facing out so you're kind of knitting like this and then when you get to the end of that section you work basically a short row turn to switch which is the inside and which is the outside of your knitting in the round so that you're always working with the color work pattern facing you this is just one by one rib it just gives a really nice effect where the cuffs kind of hug your wrist which is especially good if it's really windy or you're worried about getting snow inside your middens that is pretty much the worst so it hugs your wrist really well I really like this cuff construction and that it's fairly simple and then once you've completed that rib cuff then you're working stranded color work for the rest of the midden there is a simple thumb gusset here with increases on either side and then when you get to here you'll put the thumb stitches on hold continue working this way and I really love the top of these this is the part that sort of stands out and makes these quite an unusual pattern you get this like snowflake as your stitches come together as you decrease for the top of the middens and I really love how that detail looks the thumbs are worked afterwards by picking up your live stitches or the stitches you put on hold and then they've also got a little tiny snowflake detail on the top and Malay represents one of my favorite things to do it as, as a designer which is to take kind of traditional motifs or um, techniques and styles and play around with those maybe mod modernize them or just put my own twist on them many of the more traditional middens are incredibly beautiful and I like to knit and design more traditional styles as well knitters have always taken ideas from one place or taken ideas from another knitter and then played around with those and put their own twist on those and maybe moved to a different place and spread certain motifs and styles in that way and I love the sort of continuity of being part of that so Malay feels very representative of one of my favorite things as a designer and these are super affordable to make you can make them from one ball of each color this um pr these particular ones are in um f roma fennel um which is a heavy fingering sometimes called a sport weight yarn um in a uh, hundred percent norwegian wool is a very traditional sort of scandinavian color work yarn it is really sadly not available in the uk anymore uh, I used to stock it and I was the only stockist and I couldn't keep my online store going for a bunch of reasons but it does make me really sad that it's both difficult for me to buy um, Roma yarns unless I want to buy very large quantities and it means it's difficult for knitters in the UK to buy those um, but there are plenty of similar yarns available in wide color palettes so you definitely could substitute something else and I know some people have knit them in traditional Shetland yarns and that's definitely works very well and Malay is available in Knitworthy 4 as well so if you like both of the patterns I just showed Knitworthy 4 might be the collection for you next we have the Dray slippers and these are from last year's Knitworthy, so Knitworthy 6, and they are just so ridiculously cozy. They come in lots of sizes. This is obviously a little kid size, and like, how cute is that? They're so sweet. And these are in a chunky yarn. This is Malabrigo Chunky. Malabrigo Chunky is 100% merino. They are super soft, probably more like lounging slippers than walking on hard floors slippers. Um, but you could add leather to the bottom. I also know some people put, you get iron on non-slip things and also like a little tube of paint. That's if anyone else had a crafty 90s childhood. It's very similar to puff paint. And if you can even buy puff paint these days, that also works as a non-slip option to add to slippers. And then these ones are in Lion Brand Hue and Me, which is a wool acrylic blend and will 
seems pretty sturdy and is also a really good affordable option if you're looking for chunky yarns, which I know can be quite expensive. I want to just show you how the construction of these works because it's pretty f they're pretty fun to knit. They're a really good option if you're the kind of knitter who likes a puzzle or likes to, I don't know, likes something where it keeps changing. You get little chunks of do this and then do something different. Maybe you can learn some new skills. If that is your knitting like jam, then this pattern is perfect for you. I've got another pattern coming up that I think you will also really enjoy. These are worked from the center of the sole outwards in the round. So you start by casting on a bunch of stitches on two sides of a circular needle or two DPNs. Um, you can use a figure of eight cast on or there's a cast on method called Judy's Magic Cast On that will get you those kind of pairs of stitches connected in the middle. And then you'll work in the round. You can see there are some increases here. And then there's a little bit of short row shaping as well to make the toes wider than the heel. And then that garter stitch continues just up around the foot a little bit. So when you put them on, they've sort of got this little toe bumper, which is a detail I really like. And then you sort of alternate working around and then you're going to do a little short row where you work across just these top of the foot stitches and you decrease onto the side of foot stitches so that this section here has more rows than at the sides. And that sounds a little bit complicated, it's actually pretty easy to do and it's a really nice way to make this kind of three-dimensional seamless shape. Once you get up to here, that's the last of those kind of decreases, then you'll just work in the round for the cuff and work some one by one ribbing, which I really like as a folded cuff, makes them nice and cozy and they stay on well, nice and snug. That is the Dray slippers and there are sizes from little kids to like a large adult. So you could make a set for the whole family, which would be very adorable. Does anyone else fantasize about having a house where when visitors come in there's a basket of slippers in all different sizes? That is the dream. I have not gotten there but it is a really lovely idea to picture so I feel like the dray slippers would be excellent if that is also one of your goals. Next Next up we have the Saudaji hat which is from Knitworthy 2. This is a very classic traditional ferrule pattern and I designed this intentionally as a sampler for someone wanting to try out ferrule for the first time. Of course if you love knitting ferrule it's a fun quick project um, but that was my goal was that it was a good introduction to not just stranded color work but some specific kind of specific to the ferrule tradition um, color techniques of always having a clear background and foreground color, only working with two colors at a time. And then it's a very small introduction to shading, which is specific to the ferrule tradition of color work, where you, if I lay this down, where you kind of within one motif, you might shade from light to dark into the middle and then mirror that shading going back outwards. So here you can see I've got a lighter yellow and a darker yellow and then the lighter yellow in the middle and at the same time these two greys are, are quite similar but you get a very subtle effect of going from light through mid to dark grey here as well. And so it uses five colours if you're substituting colors, um, this is a good model to have sort of three neutrals that go from light to dark, or you could do maybe three cool colors and then two warm colors where you have a lighter and darker version, or maybe a more intense and less intense version. Um, if you're looking for an easy way to sort of substitute colors, that is where I would start. If you look at projects on Ravelry or Instagram, there are lots of amazing different colored options. It's definitely a pattern where you can really get creative and play with colors. Or of course you can just knit it in these colors and enjoy the process. 
This one is knit in Jameson and Smith jumper weight. That's their traditional sort of Shetland Feral yarn. It's very, very similar to Jameson's Spindrift, which is also a traditional Shetland yarn. Two unrelated yarn companies, Jameson is just a very common name in Shetland. I've also seen quite a few knitters use Brooklyn Tweed Loft, um, which again comes in a lot of shaded colours, so that could be a good option. And I've seen a few that look beautiful and quite different worked in sock yarn gradient sets where you get a more of a sheen and much crisper colour work and, and that can be a fun way too to use some tonal colours. Another good option for this and actually also for the Malay mitts could be Holst Garn Super Soft which also is a very traditional yarn and comes in lots of colours for colour work. The first few Knitworthy collections, the names were all kind of themed around the sort of feelings that you would want to evoke with your gifts. Um, the first one was actually just the word gift in different languages, and then the next few were kind of feelings that you might want your gift to create for the recipient. Um, and this one is Sodaje, which is a Portuguese word that really has no translation. It's a really beautiful word. That my understanding, I am not a Portuguese speaker, but my understanding from people who are, is that it's a sense of longing that's similar to homesickness or nostalgia, but not necessarily for something in the past or something you've experienced. It could be for a person, it could be um, for a sort of future dream or a fantasy or something that you know doesn't exist. And it's got a sort of connotation of being a positive feeling, like it's like an enjoyable melancholic feeling. Um, and that felt like a feeling that maybe if you received a gift from someone maybe that you hadn't seen for a long time but that was important to you and they were like thinking about you and missing you and experiencing that feeling of sadaji when they thought of you, um, that the gift might make you feel feel that in a good way and also maybe negate that feeling and make you feel closer to the person. So that is where the name for this one came from. The next pattern I want to show you is from last year's Knitworthy, Knitworthy 6, and it is the Nectar Blanket. And I loved making this so much. It's worked modularly, modular, that's hard to say out loud, um, it's worked in individual pieces, so each of these hexagons you can see here is worked separately, they're worked from the centre out, so all of your shaping, all of your increasing is part of this beautiful lace pattern, and it's worked centre out and then with this garter stitch border, so the garter stitch border is part of each hexagon, and at the end I seamed them together, um, some people have joined them with by picking up stitches and working a three needle bind off. Um, I've also seen people do a slip stitch, like a slip stitch crochet join, um, if you crochet that might be the most comfortable option for you. Um, and I really enjoyed knitting it and knitting the individual pieces as separate pieces because I knit it kind of throughout the spring and summer last year, I gave myself lots of time and it was a really good project to carry around, it was a really good portable project um, if I was on the go, I had the pattern memorized within like two or three hexagons and it was just really easy to pick up, I could, I could just work on it while I was on the bus or my kid was at the park and um, I didn't have to like keep thinking about a project and like counting and making sure I had all the right stuff and now my project is too big to carry around so it was a really good portable project. If you're a sock knitter that likes to always have a sock on the go or you've been knitting muscle bra, you've knit lots of muscle bra hats because you always like to have a project you can just pick up, this is probably a little bit less mindless um, unless you like knitting complicated socks but it is the same kind of satisfaction of having something small and portable and repetitive that you can have on the go. And something I tended to do is that if I had some time to focus, I would 
get to kind of this point and I would start a new one. I had a few pairs of needles on the go. And so that when I didn't have time to focus but needed some knitting, I had the borders to knit. And this one is really simple color-wise. It's all one color except for the border. You can see here that to make it rectangular or square, there are some filler pieces. So there's some elongated triangles here. These were super fun because if you've knit um, like a wide triangular shawl from the top down, my Ishbel pattern is a good example. These are fun because you work them in the same way as a teeny tiny top down shawl where you increase at both ends and in the middle and create these lovely elongated triangle shapes that fit perfectly into the sides of the hexagons. And then on the perpendicular edges, you put in half hexagons. You could absolutely make a beautiful blanket just with hexagons and just embrace the uneven edges. I think that could actually look really gorgeous and organic, especially if it's like for a throw on a couch, something like that. And the pattern is written for different yarn weights. You can basically, there are suggested needle sizes, and you can just use a needle size that gets you a fabric that you like. You can start swatching by knitting a hexagon or part of a hexagon, create a fabric that you like, and then decide how many hexagons to make based on how much yarn you have. Um, you can weigh your first one and calculate that. There is a formula in the pattern for calculating how much yarn you'll use based on the weight of one hexagon, including how much yarn you need for the borders. Um, so that takes the guesswork out of that a bit. And then obviously if you use a heavier yarn, your individual hexagons will be bigger. And so you can customize it to make a blanket for a baby. This is sort of a nice size for a baby blanket. It's a good size for wrapping a newborn and then putting on the floor for creating a nice play surface or tummy time surface. Um, but you can customize it and make it a blanket for anyone. You could make it for someone's sofa, you could make it bed-sized, you can make it your own. I do have another one here. Every time I make a video in this space, I do get questions about what this blanket on my chair in the background is. It is very hard to actually show because it is so big. and. This is the coziest thing ever. And you can see how much bigger the individual hexagons are. So yeah, you can see this is the exact same pattern. It's not, the number of stitches in each hexagon is the same. It's just a bigger individual hexagon. And this is in an iron weight yarn. This one is sock yarn. It's Neighborhood Fiber Company's Studio Sock. And the colorways are Oliver and Charles Center. And then this one in this lovely natural gray with this kind of heathered texture, super wooly. This is Hillesvag Vida, which is an iron weight, very traditional. You can kind of feel, this has even been washed and you can still kind of feel the lanolin in it. Um, and this is an iron weight yarn. It's very lofty, so it's still very lightweight as a blanket, which is lovely and will obviously trap lots of warmth and be really nice and cozy. And both of my examples here are one or two colors, but because the hexagons are worked modularly, there are lots of opportunities for using up scraps. You could knit every hexagon in different colors. You could sort of design a color pattern, maybe with two colors. Um, Something that looks really beautiful and that I've seen a few knitters do is to work the lace portion of each hexagon in one color and then work the garter stitch around the edges in a different color and maybe use this different color, use a variety of colors for the centers and then all one color for those borders. So that when you put it together, you get an effect like sashing on a quilt. And I really want to make one of those, but I sort of had to stop myself knitting hexagons. Um, these were really compelling to knit, but I have lots of other things to design so I can't keep knitting nectar blankets. Definitely have a look at projects for this because it's very flexible and there are so many options and so many things you could do with it. And one thing I wanted to mention is that in the pattern I said there was a formula for working out how much yarn you need, but you can also plan your layout. There are a bunch of example layouts for um, different size blankets. Um, 
and you can work out the kind of overall finish size you want based on your first hexagon and then um, how many individual hexagons you need to create that particular layout whether it's like four by five hexagons or three by four um, and then how many extra pieces so those little elongated triangles or half hexagons how many of those you need to make the whole thing work um, and then that will allow you to use the formula to estimate how much yarn you need and what your finished size will be. So hopefully that is helpful and makes planning your project easier. Here we have another project that is ideal for those of you who like to keep being entertained by your projects, I suppose. These are the Curly Mitts. These are from Knitworthy 2 and they are such a fun little puzzle. I love designing these. They're re putting that on the wrong hand. I mean, it doesn't really matter. You can choose, but I really loved designing these, and I find them so much fun to knit. And even just thinking, making notes for this episode, and thinking about how I would explain the construction, it was like a really satisfying brain teaser. So I'm going to see if I can explain the construction. First of all, I wanted to show you the yarn. This is a fingering weight merino single. This particular blue, which is this lovely, almost gray, almost neutral blue, is from Black Elephant. Happen to have an extra skein here. And this is the Utopia colorway. So this is super pretty. Um, many, many dyers have similar base yarns. Um, so you might have something in your stash. And I also wanted to show you this. This is um, like an adult medium size. They're obviously, they look quite small until you put them on and then they're super stretchy. And you want them kind of snug enough to kind of hug your hand. And this is the leftover yarn from one, so the mitts and this ball of yarn are one skein. So excellent if you are trying to make something from maybe shawl leftovers you really don't need much yarn for a pair or you could make like a matching set for maybe you and a friend or two friends um, and that could be very sweet as well you cast on at the cuff and knit a very regular cuff it's just a tube of two by two rib but then instead of continuing straight you work a provisional cast on next to your live stitches. So you keep those cuff stitches on the needles and then you add a provisional cast on. So you have kind of a cuff with like cast on stitches sticking up out of it. And then you work back and forth on the stitches you just cast on, leaving the cuff stitches on the needles, but you're only working the cuff stitches at the end of every or at the end of every right side row, you're working a cuff stitch by decreasing those hand stitches onto the cuff stitches which creates this lovely join here and on this edge you're working i-cord and that creates a really nice snug very beautifully polished edge around the top of the hand and then you keep knitting you keep doing that around and around until you get to here and then this is where it gets particularly weird and if I show you what one row is, it might make more sense. So one row we'd be working across these stitches and then back again. And what you're doing here is you're creating almost like a miter effect. So you're, there's a decrease, it's hard to see, but there is a decrease on every um, right side row here to create this lovely gusset that follows the sort of lifeline of the hand, which is absolutely my favorite style of thumb gusset. I've played around with that in a lot of patterns and kind of different ways of creating that. But I really like that curve line you get and how it mirrors the line on your hand. And on this kind of side of those ribbed stitches that will become the thumb, you're also decreasing, but you're not working any of these stitches. So these you're working these decreases to join the rib stitches that are being worked in this direction to the provisional cast on stitches 
that you created when you cast on for the hand stitches. The good news is that the pattern itself includes lots and lots of step-by-step -step photos. So if you're like, what, how does this work? Don't worry, there are step-by-step -step photos in the pattern. So you can just go through it one section at a time and it will all come together, I promise. When you get up to here, you're kind of level with the base of the thumb with a sort of knuckle on the thumb. Then you start working this little triangular gusset. I'm just going to check my focus on that. That looks like that's still in focus. Hopefully you can see it clearly. So you will start working this little triangular gusset back and forth, decreasing on both sides, and that will join this side of the back of the hand to, at the back of the hand to the remaining provisional cast on stitches for the hand here. So you work that like back and forth up to here and then you get a very neat little join by grafting the ends of your sort of I cord together. And then here, can I get my hand into the right position to show you this? Here you start working the thumb in the round again. So you work the thumb in the round and you create a little triangular gusset with those stockinette stitches and that makes this lovely fit at the thumb. It's very easy to move, it looks nice and fitted and it means that when you're done there is almost no finishing. You've kind of joined all of these bits knit in different directions together on the needles, which is one of my favorite kinds of projects, one of my favorite things to design when I've really got time to like sit down and focus on it. They are a quick project. Um, so if you're in a bit of a knitting rut and you just wanna like make something that's really satisfying and focused, the curly mitts could be a good option for you. Next we have the perfect project if you are the kind of knitter that caps on a gift the day before or a couple of days before you're due to give it to someone. This one knits up really fast. This is the Salon and Cowl from Knitworthy 2 and it's in a chunky yarn. This one is in a yarn from Miss Babs. It is Miss Babs K2. This is the color French Marigold which is perfectly named. I've got tons of marigolds in my garden right now and yeah this is just the most beautiful glowing deep orange is definitely a color I am very drawn to at this time of year it's got a bit of stuff on it and this is a one skein project but these are really big skeins so you might need a couple of um, skeins this is a 200 gram skein so it might take a couple of skeins if you're working with a yarn that has less um, weight or less fewer meters per skein. It knits up really quickly and it's also a great pattern if you are new to knitting lace because your stitches are really big so it's easy to see what's going on and um, you can get used to following a chart you get a really quick satisfying result and it could be a great stepping stone if you want to knit more complicated lace you want to knit something like the nectar blanket which isn't actually necessarily more complicated but it's more dedication, I suppose. You might be working with finer yarn, it's a bigger project. Or if you're dreaming of knitting your first lace shawl, then this could be a really good option. If you're new to knitting lace or you've never knit lace, I also want to mention that we have a bunch of tutorials and also a totally free online course on knitting your first lace shawl. And all everything in it would apply to knitting any lace item like this. Um, it goes through how to follow a chart, the individual techniques that you need to use, like yarn overs, the different decreases. Um, it's got a whole section on fixing mistakes and kind of troubleshooting if maybe you have the wrong stitch count, how to figure out where it went wrong. So that's totally free to join. I will put a link to that if you want to check out our free beginner lace shawl course. This is the Seps Berry from Knitworthy 6 and this is definitely one of my, it's hard to choose, but this is one of my personal favorites for sure. It's so satisfying. 
So it's worked bottom up. You start with this teeny tiny folded hem. I don't think I can stretch it enough to show you, but this one has a narrow elastic that's enclosed in the hem as you create the hem, and that is shown how to do that in the pattern. And that just means you get this very secure fit. The elastic's optional, but I did like having it. Um, and you create this tiny folded hem, and then you pick up stitches from your cast on edge, kind of in between every one of your live stitches, so that you get these alternating knit purls. So the purl stitches here are coming from the inside edge of that folded hem. I told you this was satisfying. And then you're working twisted rib. It's actually half twisted rib because twisting purl stitches is kind of a pain and you can't see them, so I didn't bother. You can see it looks like regular rib on this side. Half twisted rib is a little easier to work and creates a lovely firm fabric, which is exactly what you want for a beret. You want it to hold its shape. So they're twisted rib and then um, you're working straight here. But once you start shaping the crown, decreases are all worked in the knit rows that are in between these bands of twisted ribbing. And they're worked in pairs so that all the way around the circle, your knit stitches are beautifully stacked on top of a purl, like a purl column from the previous band. If the decreases aren't worked in pairs, then you get sort of some that are offset and some that aren't as you go around. And no one wants that. So they're beautifully like offset all the way around. As you go into the middle, you're working kind of narrower and narrower bands and you get this lovely circle. It's got a bit of a crease in it here, but it does lie beautifully flat. And then you finish with a teeny little I-cord stock, which is very pleasing. I love wearing this. There's just something about Barbara Beret that you can put it at a jaunty angle. And I've seen quite a few people recently mentioning this pattern as an option for recreating Barbie's pink beret definitely would work well. That could be an option if that's something you want or if you're knitting it as a gift and um, maybe you have someone who would be thrilled with that. So that could be a good option. And this one is worked in um, a very simple DK weight wool from West Yorkshire Spinners. It's their pure DK held together with a mohair. This one is Phil Colana uh, Tilia. It's a really soft mohair silk. I think that might be my favorite mohair silk like lace weight. There's lots of yarns in that category, but I really like that particular one. It's very um, it's very soft and very delicate. And then the um, West Yorkshire Spinners Pure is a really, really soft... Um, it's a really... yeah. It's just a really soft, luxurious wool yarn. So those two together make for something that's both beautifully soft and cozy and tactile and also has the structure and the sturdiness. It's knit at a tight gauge so you do need an iron weight yarn or like this one, this is a DK and lace weight held together to create an iron weight yarn and then knit at a much more like DK or even sport weight gauge so it is knit very tightly. My ninth pattern in this list of my personal favorite knitworthy patterns is the Belize Knits. I've got two colorways here. Both of these are worked in Joan Arben Yarnadelic, which is a worsted spun sport weight. Um, it's a cordel, so it's, um, it's got more of a sheen and a bit more structure than Merino, but it's still lovely and smooth and soft. And this is worked in two colors, two kind of highly contrasting colors, so you get this really crisp color work effect. It's probably obviously inspired by Norwegian selbu middens with this classic Norwegian star motif, which is echoed in sort of smaller version on the thumb. And then this little kind of diamond pattern border. And I feel like this really showcases how effective even very small, very simple color work patterns can be. It's very satisfying. And you could, of course, work this in more colors. Middens in Shetland and Feral often use the same or very similar motifs to sort of two color Norwegian patterns, but do that classic Feral shading 
within either the motif or the background or both. And these are another fun kind of construction puzzle. They're actually worked from the fingertips down. I never know whether to say top down or bottom up with gloves and mittens, uh, but fingertips down is probably clearer, even if it's not as succinct. And this uses a technique that I believe was first developed by Meg Swanson, who is the legendary knitwear designer and innovative knitwear Elizabeth Zimmerman's daughter and an amazing designer in her own right. And this technique basically works like an I-cord. So if you've knit an I-cord, you knit, cast on three stitches on a double pointed needle or a short circular, you knit a row and instead of turning at the end of your row and purling back, you slide the stitches to the other end, pull your yarn around the back and knit the next row. And usually that's done with three stitches, sometimes four to make like a kind of round cord. You might have tried it. You can also work an I cord with more stitches. You just end up with a point at which you can't pull the last stitch and the first stitch together and you get a little gap between them, a sort of ladder of yarn. And the genius thing about this technique for fingers is that they're worked like that. You cast on one fewer stitches than you need for your finger and then you take a crochet hook and you treat it like a drop stitch. You kind of ladder a stitch up from your cast on edge to fill in that little gap where you have your yarn kind of laddered across. So for Belize, you create four little I-cord fingers and then you join them together in the round. And again, this is a pattern that has lots of step-by-step -step photos, if that sounds kind of confusing or daunting. And then you work in the round, start your color work pattern, and you'll also have made a little I-cord for the thumb, so you'll put those, add those stitches to your needle when you get to the thumb. And then these also have the kind of single set of shaping gusset that I'm really fond of for the thumbs. So they kind of follow that natural um, line of your hand. It's a very natural ergonomic shape and I think it looks really beautiful. And the colorways for this one are Wondrous Place and Ordinary Joe. Ordinary Joe is the undyed. You can see the really lovely, it's kind of a warm pale grey. It's got a little, it's kind of mushroomy and also silvery. It's a very pretty natural yarn colour. If you have been following for a long time, you might remember when I did my custom spun yarn blend number one, from which was spun by John Arbin. And this yarn is the closest they've come to releasing a similar yarn to blend number one, which is what we worked the original version of Belize in. So I love this yarn. Something that makes it really ideal for a project like this too is that it's available in mini skeins. And this is the leftovers of a mini skein that we had from making this pair of mitts. So you, I haven't weighed it, but I think you could probably get a second pair out of it. So that's really good value and it's nice for a small colour project that you don't have to buy two full 100 gram skeins to make a project like this. And then these two are blue, the sort of brighter colour is Woman in Blue. And then the darker one is Black Gold of the Sun. I don't know how well the camera is picking this up. You can kind of see that this is a really heathered colour. There's like some brighter blues, there's some brighter blues and indeed gold in there, as well as this very dark, almost charcoaly colour. And I love how alive that is when you look at it close up. Finally, pattern number 10 is the Creole Cowl, which was also from Knitworthy 6 last year. And you can see I'm wearing it. Um, I thought this was a really good example of how different the same pattern can be in different yarns and different colours. This is a really good alternative to making a shawl, especially for a gift because it's so easy to toss on and wear. It's not confusing, there's not a lot of styling, and it also stays on well. You don't have your shawl slipping or if you tuck the ends in, it's not going to come loose. Especially good if you live somewhere like here, which tends to be super windy in the winter. And it's worked in a combination of mostly garter stitch stripes and two color brioche. The bottom edge is worked with ribbing or one side of the triangle. And it's a fun sampler of two color brioche stitch patterns. 
perfect if you've never tried to color brioche. It's a great kind of manageable introduction. For this one here, I used a very um, classic wool yarn from Blue Sky Fibers. This is their wool stock in Midnight Sea. And then the neutral color here, this sort of natural color is Driftwood. You can see this subtle, beautiful gradient sort of stripe pattern happening here that continues all the way through each of my brioche bands. And this yarn is from Yarn Hero, it's their Color Mix DK. So you want a DK or worsted weight yarn for this project. And their Color Mix DK is one of those kind of long fade self-striping barber pole yarns. A similar option would be some of Spin Cycles yarns. A project like this where you're working with two colors, either if it's two color brioche or stranded color work or a slip stitch kind of mosaic knitting pattern, can be a really good way to use those colors and add this like extra sense of movement to your pattern. I thought this turned out really beautifully with that gradient. And construction wise, it's actually hard to show joined together because I can't lay it flat, but hopefully I can sort of lay it out enough you, you get the idea. So this edge here is the cast on, and then you're working in this direction. Um, this edge, after you cast on, you'll be increasing until you get to here. And then this edge here is worked straight. And it's worked straight until you get all the way up to here. When you get to here at the beginning, you will stop increasing and then you start decreasing. And you start decreasing to create this kind of angled edge that becomes the straight edge at the top of your cowl. So you're working in this direction and decreasing to create that straight edge there all the way until you get to here. So at this point at the back, this is the end of the cowl. The actual end is this little kind of tip here. So you can see quite clearly with this two color brioche that you're decreasing on both sides from this point so that you create a, an edge that will be the right angle to join to that edge where you were increasing at the beginning. So the final step will be to seam those together and create this cowl that's, that's sort of a bandana effect. It's obviously much deeper at the front a point and I find that's really easy to wear. You can wear it with the point straight down or kind of turn it a bit, have that kind of go over your shoulder. There are options there but I find it's, I've worn this one in these colors so much because it's really easy to just like toss on over anything and make your outfit look kind of pulled together. And this one is also a great example if you're knitting gifts on a budget. This is a really affordable yarn option. It's from the UK chain Hobbycraft, so it probably is only available in the UK, but I'm sure there are really similar yarns available elsewhere. It is uh, recycled, which is great, especially for um, a synthetic fiber yarn. I think it's 85% polyester and 15% acrylic, and it's called Make the Change. Um, and the colors are denim, cream, and mustard. I really enjoyed working with this yarn. The only like downside is that it comes in a really tiny color palette, so there aren't many. There, are, I didn't, I didn't find many good three color options from their color palette. But maybe they'll expand it. Um, and if you know of a similar yarn, especially another one that is from Recycled Fibers, do let me know in the comments down below. I would love to find some yarns similar to this one because. I found it really easy to wear, um, which is perfect if you're knitting a gift, especially for a non-knitter. You don't have to worry too much about how they're going to take care of it. You could throw it in the washing machine and with all your regular clothes and it would be absolutely fine. When I realized I had three stranded color work projects in that top 10 roundup, I wanted to sneak in one more pattern because I know strand of color work can be a bit daunting if you've never tried the technique before. And this is another knitworthy pattern that is called the Easy Feral Cowl because it is a perfect pattern if you have never knit strand of color work or feral for sort of learning the basics. 
Getting Comfortable. He's worked in a chunkier yarn than any of these projects. This is Jameson's Aran Weight. It comes in lots of beautiful, kind of classic heathered feral colors. If you would like to learn more about knitting, stranded color work, including how I knit stranded color work and lots of other ways to hold your yarn and needles and get comfortable working with two colors at the same time, how to follow color work charts, um, and some tips for good projects to kind of get started with. I do have an online course called Stranded Colorwork Basics that you might want to check out. It's got videos and step-by-step -step photo and written instructions um, and it really takes you through how to work your first Stranded Colorwork project in a really structured way and how to grow your confidence and grow your muscle memory for the sort of managing two colors, whether you knit English or Continental, or my favorite option is one color in each hand. So I'll show you both how to do those, how to hold your yarn, how to work out which method you prefer. And the feedback I've gotten from multiple knitters who've taken the course is that it was the thing that finally made color work click for them. So if you are interested in stranded color work or you've tried it before and didn't quite get it, then my course, Strand of Colorwork Basics, might be for you, and I'll put a link down below to that, as well as to all of these patterns. I hope wherever you are in the world, and whatever the current weather is like, that this has left you feeling inspired for knitting season. Uh, maybe you've found something that you're excited to cast on. Maybe I've gotten you excited about what's to come in Knitworthy 7. I know I can't wait to share those patterns with you. Um, I've been working on them for a long time. We decided to shoot a lot of them. Um, we went on a family trip to visit um, my pattern director and really good friend uh, Bex, who now lives in Alberta, Canada. And we went on a family trip to visit her um, back in March and April. And we were really fortunate that there was still some snow in the mountains, so we managed to do a really wintry, magical photo shoot there. Um, so I've been working on the patterns for that for months, and it's been hard not to share them in all that time. Um, I feel really grateful for our preview knitters for those patterns, because partly it just gives me like a group of people to talk about them with, and who are excited about them, and have that I can share them with um, so that I don't bubble over and accidentally share them publicly. Because I know for those of you who've participated in Knitworthy before, part of the fun really is the getting a surprise. So I don't want to spoil it, I don't want to tell you anything about what to expect in Knitworthy um, this year, but what I would say is that the patterns here are a pretty good example of the kind of projects you might find. There's a range of techniques, where there are sort of specific techniques like color work or cables or brioche, they're generally patterns that would be good as your first try at that sort of technique. Um, most of the patterns are approachable if you're sort of a like adventurous advanced beginner, maybe you've made a few projects, you're comfortable with gauge, increasing, decreasing, but you want to expand your techniques, you want to learn some new skills, and they're all designed to be both fun to knit, regardless of your experience level, and things that like a wide variety of people that you might want to make a gift for would appreciate. So the pre-order discount is currently running on Knitworthy 7. The first pattern comes out on September 21st, and then there will be a new pattern every other week on Thursdays um, until six patterns have been released. And that pre-order discount will go up to full price on September 21st when the first pattern comes out. So if you don't want to miss out on that, do go and order it now. And as I said at the beginning, if you want to start in your Ravelry library, you don't need to worry about buying it on my website. We will send you instructions for how to add it to Ravelry once we're able to do that on September 21st. Thank you so much for watching. I will be back next week with the first pattern in Knitworthy 7 with the reveal of what that is and also sharing more of my works in progress and what I've been up to. Until then, take care and happy knitting.